We're back with another episode of Real Talk. Uh, we want to thank all of our sponsors at Park Bank. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for our sponsors like our Facebook project, Journalism. Thank you so much. We are back today with our um, weekly update with our good friend, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Sir, how are you? I'm doing all right, man. How are you? You know, I, I, we're saying offline, I'm tired. I'm tired physically, mm-hmm. tired emotionally, mentally right now. You know, the grind is getting to me a little bit now, right, bro? I mean, all the COVID-19 stuff and, you know, George Floyd getting killed and the Arbery stuff that we we're doing. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a, then we did our big summit on Friday. We did all that in one week. Mm-hmm. So, tired, man. I'm tired, but it's a, it's a whole lot, man. I'm worn. Yeah. Yeah. Is that how you feel? How are you feeling? Yeah. Worn. Yeah. It's a whole lot, man. It's, it's, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a lot. And a lot of it, too, is, is you know educating people that you just didn't think would need to be educated on something like this i think about like folks who post like all these book recommendations podcast recommendations music and i'm like well you need all this (laughs) and it's like how do you not just know and like i I think about other issues right that i i I never read a book about you know agriculture to know that the decline in family farms across this country especially in this state is going to be devastating and it's already having a devastating impact it's going to get worse it didn't take reading a book to find that out or to realize that i I talked to some i talked to some family farmers i see what i see in the news and then you can i I just don't get how, how it's that hard for some people to like just become enlightened at this point about a 400 years old issue yeah, it's interesting. Like that's a good point. Someone asked me the other day, "What makes this this example different from the past?" Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I mean, only thing I could point to is COVID nineteen, right? That people have to be stand still and they're not doing other. They're not busy in their lives, and so they actually had to had no other choice but to focus on Ahmad and Brianna, and then you know, yeah. uh, uh, our brother Floyd who got killed up in uh, Minneapolis, and then with the brother who got discriminated against against a white woman in New York. I mean, I think I think all that stuff made people just say, "Wait a minute!" Like that I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not busy enough to focus on that. So I think I think that's it. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, and then like I just try to find like ways to like productively talk about these sorts of things, too. Um, like there was this uh, this uh, sheriff in George Floyd's birthplace said that his dream of uh, being a police officer is now a nightmare, and I think about that. And and I look, let me let me say this: I know police officers have a difficult job, but the reforms that folks are looking for, you know, uh, for more accountability, de-escalation, all that, that's to make police officers' jobs easier. When we talk about community investment, making sure that our schools are fully funded, making sure that there are programs and services for residents, uh, you see a less of a need for, for, for law enforcement to get involved in these in, in dicey in what will be dicey situations. And that's evidence all across America, you know communities with uh, more wealth and more opportunity uh, don't see the same sorts of issues. But when that officer said the thing about his dream of being an officer is now a nightmare, like it got me to thinking because I remember as a kid playing cops and robbers like so many other kids did. Or, you know, watching action movies, police movies. How many police movies are there? You know, you got Die Hard. You got, you know, I go back to your days with Action Jackson. Hey. And, <laughs> but, you know, you got all these movies and, and people see that and they get excited by it. Like, oh, wow, this is an actual job. I can go into this job and they get there and realize it's not as action packed as the movies let on. Or it's not a game of cops and robbers every day. And then with that disappointment, they still have this passion. They still have like this excitement that just in these fantasies that just linger on. And when you realize like, oh, I'm probably not going to get into this sort of situation where there's this loud explosion behind me and I go flying in the air or I'm in some you know highway shootout and I bust some criminal operation that spanned 30 states. When they see that this is not the case, you get the instances like uh, like a George Floyd. Like, All right, well, I'm taking down a bad guy. Or even a Walter Scott in South Carolina when he was running away and they shot him in the back and whatever other instance. Like the people, you know, tend to take it overboard because their fantasies haven't yet been realized. And we got to get out of that mold of, uh, of policing. We have to get to a, a, a place where, you know, people understand that it is about making communities safer. Uh, it's not going to be what you saw in the movie. It's not going to be uh, the games you played as a kid. This is very serious work, and it has to be it has to be taken as such. So, uh, just talking about the police officers, it was your the Milwaukee police chief said uh, that he felt the police are being crucified, right? Like 
in Milwaukee right now. Uh, he actually said that some police are getting followed home, that, uh, you know, that he, they're worried about families. He feels like the police are getting crucified right now. What, what, what do you think about that? What I am saying uh, to that is, are police officers having a hard time? Yes, but it's a, they haven't confronted the issue that's so pervasive. They haven't f- confronted the issue, for, by and large, have not confronted uh, the reason why people are angry and people are protesting. Like, it's about, you know, you got to humble yourself and admit fault. You, these are public servants we're talking about. Police officers are public servants. So addressing uh, that a problem exists and this problem continues is a first step to help build trust with communities because you see so much like avoidance of, uh, of their of there being a problem, you see much so much uh, avoidance of, of taking responsibility, and of course, communities are going to continue to distrust you and look in a, and, and look at you in a negative light uh, if if what is so apparent hasn't even been acknowledged. Now, like I said, I get it. The job is hard. The job is stressful, but that's because the job has not adapted with the times. The job hasn't evolved. The job hasn't uh, it hasn't you know been reformed in a way that will meet today's societal needs and even when you see like in new york city like the the protests and like the resp- or even in washington dc the response to to protesters uh, you know who are protesting brutality they're getting brutalized and i said this on msnbc uh yesterday that you don't see firefighters rush to the scene with a can of propane in their hand because why would they, right? Like if this is a this is if this is about responding to situations uh, appropriately, and you know I, I I don't think that the de-escalation is there. I don't think uh, I don't I don't think working to peacefully resolve a situation is always the first thing. And I I, I will recognize again I will recognize that there are some good people in the profession, but we need those good officers to step up, and you know. That look at Buffalo where they shoved that seventy-five year old man. You know, the dude. I don't even know what kind of condition he's in right now. But that was pointless. That was pointless violence. Didn't have to happen. So but you know, I, I, I hear everything you're saying. So let's flip that around. Mm-hmm. Here in Milwaukee, because Milwaukee is you know the, the epicenter of the state. Um, Milwaukee has a tremendous amount of violence. Tremendous. I mean, I, I bet, I bet only Chicago's probably ahead of Milwaukee in the Midwest is my guess, um, and I bet it's not by much. So Milwaukee is extremely, especially in the summertime, is violent. A lot of gun violence. Um, and what would you say to the people who are watching and saying, "Yeah, I hear you about the police, but the police, yes, forty-five percent of the budget goes to the police, and yes, all that stuff." But it's only doing that, Lieutenant Governor, because the crime is so high in Milwaukee that people are unsafe. We can't be in the city. We're all moving out to the suburbs, etc. Like, yes, but it's violent. So we need the police officers to do something. Every now and then they might get rough, whatever. There's one bad apple out of all of them, okay. But we need something to happen to take care of all these this, this crime going on in our city. Yeah, um, to that I would say, first, I am against violence in all forms. I have lost friends to gun violence, personal friends, uh, one in the last two years. So that's an issue that is forever close to me. It's one of the reasons why I got involved in politics. Uh, But I will say uh, police don't prevent crimes from happening. Uh, We're not, we don't live in a surveillance state, nor would you want to. So there isn't, this isn't the minority report. You know, you can't, pre- it's not like cops are just showing up to stop something before it happens. They are, they are, uh, they are to respond and to try to solve crimes. And if you look at the number of crimes that don't get solved, you may be shocked to learn that number. And, you know, is a, do people like, you know, I, I think about like my parents or, you know, or their neighbors and any neighbors in any community, right? If somebody's house gets broken into, they're gonna call the police. So yeah, people understand that. People people get that, but people also understand or should think about exploring the ideas of what a reformed uh, law enforcement entity could look like and how communities could be better served. That's, that's, that's what it's ultimately about. Uh, and I, I brought up those budget numbers in the beginning because 
uh, it, it still goes back to, uh, you know, you can look at a city like Milwaukee where their their violence does exist and there's no escaping them. I've worked to do everything I could do to help. And I still continue to do that to make sure that we do everything that we can to keep uh, to keep gun violence down, making sure, uh, you know, pushing for legislation that makes it more difficult um, you know, for people to possess firearms who wish to commit crimes. So I've never ignored that. And, you know, I hope people, I hope, I hope people continue to press on those issues. Uh, but again, this is about safety overall. And it's about, uh, and, and it's about the, the things that you want to see. I think it's, I think folks will want to see more money in the libraries. I think folks will want to see more money in, in neighborhood services, paved roads. And, um, other thing in, in job creation, business opportunities, things that have been statistically, scientifically, and just common sense proven to reduce crime rates. Don't you think that sometimes uh, people, we're not in America, we're not really good about history. And saying that, for like, using Milwaukee, for example, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in the country on purpose. It was designed that way. Policies were put in place to make Milwaukee segregated, right? So it's like if you segregate people, if you purposely put policies in place to put people in a situation, over time, if you don't have the education right, if you don't fund the education the way it should be, all those things, things start to happen where people start to feel hopeless. They start to do things that they might not should do, but it might be the only outlet, right? So... You have to put that into consideration to how they got there. Where now, what's going on is a it's the evolution of the policies in place that now put black people how they are right now and the conditions they are in those communities. Right? Would Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, all most of this is by design, you know. And I will say one point about Milwaukee segregation is it was that way when Milwaukee was all European. You know, the Irish had their own neighborhood, Italians had their own neighborhoods, Germans, Polish, they all had their own neighborhoods. And as migration ha happened, you saw those neighborhoods start to shift and yeah. one ethnic group filled in where another one left. Yeah. So you, yesterday you were at a, a <laughs> march on Sunday. You were in a march in Madison <laughs> by the African-American uh, Church Council. Uh, it was reported to be over 10,000 people there. It was huge. I guess out of all the protests, that was the biggest day of the, all, the whole time. What did you think when you were there? I mean, it was it looks like it was a rainbow, right? Like, look, like everyone was there, every race, ethnicity. Uh, it was. It, it was. It was a community that we wanted to build. And then I think about when we got close to the Capitol, uh, the pastor who was uh, Latino, he got up and he talked about the folks who would address him and say, well, what about all lives? Don't all lives matter? And he said that his response is, you know, if we're in a city uh, with the level of education attainment is the way that it is for African-Americans, if we have an incarceration rate the way that it is for African-Americans, then yeah, sure, all lives matter, but somebody needs to take a look and really question, do black lives matter? And he said that is why he, uh, you know, that's why he was there. That's why he was talking about the things that he talked about. But the march was, you know, hats off to um, uh, Pastor, Pastor Marcus, Marcus Allen, Pastor yeah. Marcus Allen, and um, Reverend Ever uh, Mitchell. Reverend Ever Mitchell, who yeah. who was there, two two good friends of mine, and um, I, I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, one, they've, you know, I've 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 developed real relationships with with both of them. And they had what they had was going on. And the reason why they had it going on, it was one that I couldn't sit out. So I popped up, I showed up and it wasn't about being there to be recognized. It wasn't about being there to give a speech because there were was a list of speakers and it wasn't. The, and I wasn't there. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to be there to experience it as a person who is, you know, personally impacted. Like you take away this position, I'm just as vulnerable as anybody else in these streets, right? So um, I wanted to be there to e experience it from, from that vantage point, not as not as Lieutenant Governor. I want to be there to experience it as Mandela Barnes. And I haven't, I've never sat one of these kind of things out either. Like that's that's another, that's another part. It doesn't matter what the issue was, whether it was the Act 10 protests back in 2011, whether it's immigrants rights marches or whether it's pride parades across, across this state. I'm, you know, I, this is definitely was not going to be one uh, that I was going to sit out. Yeah. Do you do you think worry about all these protests like yesterday, Sunday, 10,000 people? COVID-19 is still real. 
and, and that was and that was part of my hesitation too. Like it, I had I went back and forth a lot about whether I was going to show up or not. Um, and it it was it was it was COVID based, right? Like because COVID is still very real, and these sorts of you know and, and mass gatherings can be breeding grounds for 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 COVID infections. Um, I had to make a I had to make a, a a call on that one. And I think about the people that put their lives or put their health their lives and health at risk to go vote on April seventh in person. Uh, I think about the people who've you know put themselves at risk to be out here. And I tried to social distance as much as I can as I could. It wasn't it wasn't easy, man. And like it it, it was not, it was not easy to, no. to remain distant. Well, ten thousand people and you're lieutenant governor. I mean, can't be that easy to you know. Going incognito on everyone. Yeah, yeah like, and, and I think about like um, I was in I was incognito for a while, but I think about like a couple people I ran into that like you know tried to tap me on my shoulder. I'm like, <laughs> like I didn't, then I thought about like, oh man, that's, that's terrible optics. <laughs> Don't touch me. <laughs> but, but I want your vote. Don't touch me. Give me your vote. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I get it. I get it. So it looks like COVID nineteen. Looks like the numbers are going down a little bit. It's like like Dane, Dane, and Milwaukee are kind of steady, and the rest of the states kind of going down. Is that is that how you read it? Oh, uh, that's how that's how I read it as of now. But it's still fluid because we haven't seen two weeks of, uh, of, that, yeah. of that trend. So, and plus we haven't. I don't think we've seen the impact of the protests yet. I mean, I think there's yeah. going to be some yeah. pushback of the protests. Right. I really, I really do. So Friday we had this, this our, our summit uh, and it was wonderful. We had it all day from nine to five. We had five different panels on criminal justice reform, education reform, uh, business, corporate like corporate and justice. Uh, we had like a nonprofit one. We had about fifty five thousand views uh, in one day. So it was really well. And what's interesting to me was we had so many different people from different view- views. All of their stories though everyone had stories of talking about being black and going through racism uh in society and that is shaking like because you know we have people like Corey nettles on it people like uh talisa yancey from american family cedric ellis from cuna mutual i mean we had like you know glory lands of billing joanne prince we had a lot of people on it and they all the stories were similar about black folks struggling and what hit me was a lot of these young people now i think they kind of feel like they're the only people who have gone through the struggle and lots sometimes they don't hear the black people who have actually who are who've made it uh talk about their struggles and to me that hit me mm-hmm. that how black people have really been struggling from for a long long time even the ones who are, who are more accomplished Right. So so that's a good point because people people see you in one place and assume that you've been there forever. Yeah. It's like I gotta remind you, man, I have not been in this position long and there I had a life before this happened. And the life that I I lived and experienced is that much different uh than anybody else in our in our community. Yeah, so I it hit me like how do we make how do we let the youth know that what they're feeling right now and experience that they have gone through as bad. It might not be as bad as some of the, our elders. Like I give you an example. My dad left the South when he was 18 from Mississippi, Bells only Mississippi. And he left because black folks were getting lynched down there. So he, they left the South at 18 years of age. He graduated from high school and left half the South was like that. Right. So that was a different mm-hmm. intense time. So it's just, it was just an interesting time to me that all the people were talking about how their stories were. And, how they all felt like uh, social justice needed to be not just from a criminal justice reform, but how they need to be. We need to look at the lens, racial lens across the board, from government to uh, to private sector to nonprofit. So it was interesting. It was, yeah. Uh, so, did, what about you growing up? Did you have any? Like, did you? Where did you grow up? I was I grew up in Milwaukee. Oh man. So what? What? So what? Did you have any like, experiences growing up in Milwaukee that a uh, youth could hear that could say like? That lieutenant governor had to overcome something to get somewhere. I mean, the the, the general stuff, but it's like I don't even necessarily look at it because it, it's so ingrained, right? Like it's these are the things that we just come to expect in life. You know, I remember one time I did a, a book report on Stevie Wonder, and my teacher told me I didn't write it. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. Yeah, but I always, you know, the schools I attended, I, I was I was always at a ninety nine percent black school. Oh, ninety nine. I was always at a ninety to ninety nine percent black school. Okay. From K to from from kindergarten through college. So wow, yeah. 
So well, anyway, that's that's interesting. Like, like, there's so many people can have these horror stories, man, about growing up and racism. So, you know. Anyways, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for everything that you're doing. Uh, again, stay safe. Again, every week goes by, something new happens. So it'll be interesting. Next mm-hmm. time we talk on Monday, is something new. Oh, oh, before we go, what are you watching on Netflix? What are you watching? You know, I haven't even watched anything. What? I haven't watched anything. I know I haven't watched anything. I've been playing 2K, but <laughs> I haven't watched anything. No books, nothing. Still got books I gotta finish, man. Still just stuck in the middle. Just I'm at that point. Yeah, it feels like that, right? That, that grind. I'm, I'm at that point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we gotta find everyone. So everyone who's watching, grab a book, do something proactive, shake out of this. We know the times are feeling, you know, feel like a lot of changes happening at one time. There's lots of stuff going on. Find some place that you find some peace and, you know, have, keep faith that things will change. Good leaders like our, our lieutenant governor here, we're, we're moving in the right direction. It feels uncomfortable now, but we're, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, I, be, I sincerely believe that. So thank you for your time, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. We'll see you next time. All right, man. Talk to you soon. And thanks for joining us for Real Talk.